This segment is about people, all about people. It's amazing some of the stories and things you come across when you talk with people for a little while, if you're just open to it. I meet people all over the world on the internet and in person locally and in my travels, and they've often got such incredible stories to tell. This series is about some of those people. The gentleman I'm about to interview, his name is Chris. He was born in England, moved to Africa, and from there on to Australia. He's got some amusing stories and some really fascinating ones and a few scary things to talk about, and I appreciated Chris coming on to talk with us about it. Now, this is obviously recorded online, so I'll be putting images on the screen for you to see during the conversation. I think you're going to really, really enjoy this. Now, it starts in a rather abrupt way because Chris and I were having a conversation. I said, hey, let me go ahead and record this. So it leads in. It sounds a little odd the way it starts, but catch on, hang on, and it's an interesting, interesting life this man led and leads. I was in, um, trying to figure this out, uh, probably about (coughs) the equivalent of grade seven when my neighbors, who just happened to be my girlfriend and her brother, her mother and her father were murdered in their beds. Now, in order to explain this, you know, Kenya was sparsely populated as far as whites were. You know, we had all the elite areas and um, we lived on what is called the Great Rift Valley Road. Our next door neighbor was a good 25 minute drive away from where we were. Wow. Um, so we literally had a bush telegraph. You know, if one family got into trouble, they would pick up the phone and ring, you know, the next family down down the road or down the range or whatever it was to say, hey, we've just had problems. You might be having problems in an hour's time. Be ready. And so one night my problem. father had this knock at the door and there were um, five, from memory, black men, pangas. And a panga is a long, I don't know if you know it or have seen it in America, but it's got a very heavy wooden handle and it's got a wicked blade. It's like a scimitar. Mm-hmm. You know, and they use it for cutting down bamboo up in Mount Kenya and Kilimanjaro. And um, these guys were armed with pangas and rifles and everything else. My father just picked up the nearest weapon. I went to bed with, you know, sort of rifles at the door, grown up with weaponry, even had it at school. And he let off a few fu- warning shots to these guys and said, if you make a step further, I'm going to shoot you and kill you. And then ring the police up and let them know. And um, these guys just turned tail and ran. And um, my father rang up the police and mentioned to the police that he hadn't heard from the neighbours, you know, who were further down the road from what we were. So they'd actually moved down in towards the city, if you can understand that. And um, the police went around to check on these neighbours of ours and found all the the family dead. Um, You know, that's an escape from death, I guess you can call it for me. But yeah, that's one thing I do remember about Kenya. In Rhodesia, we sorry, in Uganda, um, when we arrived in Uganda in 1969-1970, Idi Amin came into power, and I'm sure you've heard of who what who he, who he was. He wanted the same thing. He wanted Uganda free and clear of all whites because Uganda was another British British colony. And while he had been fighting for the British in Kenya against the Mau Mau and brought into power by the British in Uganda, he turned out to be, well, a dictator and murdering all the whites and a lot of his own people. An African Hitler, for want of a better way, because he was. He murdered so many people that Uganda became a um, nearly a desert state, you know, And they've only just recently started to pull up out of the problems that he caused all these years ago, you know, 30 years ago or so. Yeah, and this is all during the winds of change period, you know, that Macmillan spoke about in the 50s. And I was there growing up right in the middle of it sort of thing. I went to a school called the Banda which is now a univer- uh, sorry, a, an Olympic training village, you know, for all the runners they have. Mm-hmm. And um, every single solitary classroom I went into, and this was an old hotel that they'd converted, you know, into a school. And um, it was still set up like a hotel. It was a beautiful setting and all this sort of stuff going on there. And Every classroom had a shotgun and a rifle up on the wall that the teacher could grab should anything, you know, happen towards the kids. The funny thing is, with the school, all I remember is seeing 
baboons race through the, the schoolyard, you know? Baboons? The space. Baboons. <laughs> um, because it was a funny setup. We lived on the, like I said, the road to um, the Great Rift Valley, and a lot of it was game, game reserve. You know, so you had areas that had been marked out for human habitation, but there were great big eight, nine-foot fences with barbed wire and all this sort of stuff to keep the animals at bay. The baboons were attracted by all the sandwiches and all the food that the kids had thrown away. We'd all sit outside with the teacher waiting, you know, to be picked up by mum or dad. And um, <laughs> these baboons would, you know, race up over the fence and across the, the little road and into the school and forage in the bins and then go back out to wherever they came from. So, yeah, this is... That's funny, you know, you memories. think about schoolyard bullies. You don't think yeah. about baboons being the schoolyard bullies. <laughs> yeah, this is all the memories I have. So in you... South Africa, um, we got there when I was in Form 8, which I guess you Americans would call Grade 8. And having, you know, I'm 13, 14 by this time. And um, I've grown up in Kenya where the white man and the black man get on well together. And I had this growing up, you know, where equality. And I go to South Africa at the top of apartheid where you probably know the black man was told he could not cohabit with the white man. And um, I'm sitting in class at the age of 14 listening to the teacher rabbit on about how the Dutch had arrived and they'd... Um, conquered the land and, you know, all this sort of stuff and they'd fought against the English and driven the English back and mm -hmm. all this paraphernalia came out of her mouth. And I stood up at the age of 14 and I said, excuse me, miss, what makes you think the white man is better than the black? You did steal their land from them. And I was expelled. Wow. Uh, my father, <laughs> I had to take a home, home a letter from my father showing, you know, due cause. My father took the letter and read it, handed it to my mother, took the letter back from her, read it again and looked at me and said, you didn't say this, did you? And I said, yes, Dad. And he just shook his head and laughed and, you know, I got more punishment at school. I got six of the best school, got expelled, got sent to a, um, a Boer boarding school. Now, the Boers are the Afrikaners who set up this, the apartheid system. I was an English boy in an Africana school, and my reputation had followed me, and it was not nice. But I managed to, you know, keep my head clear and got called into the army, served um, two years national service in South Africa, patrolling the Limpopo River, which is the border of, you know, the northern border of South Africa. Did my time and migrated to Australia, where I've been ever since. Did so, you uh, get in a lot of fights when you were a kid in Africa? I got into a lot of fights in, in South Africa at the boarding school, yes, because they viewed the English still with hostility, and they still do now. You know, sort of remember 1975 in South Africa was only 70 years from the cessation of hostilities between South Africa and Great Britain in the Boer War. So there were kids in the school whose grandparents had fought against you know, possibly my grandparents, except my grandparents hadn't fought in the Boer War. They'd fought, you know, my family had fought earlier in the Zulu War in South Africa. And um, nobody would listen, you know, because I was English, I was tired with the same brush as every other Englishman. You know, I'd put their families in the concentration camps. I caused their grandparents to die and all this sort of paraphernalia. It was stupid and it was childish and it was horrific because, you know, the racism just kept going. And I'm not sure if it's still going today because now that the um, the ANC have taken charge of politics there, but I'm sure that the racism, you know, amongst the whites is still there. How still many the years same. with you were you there altogether in Africa? I was in South Africa from nineteen sixty sorry, in Africa from nineteen sixty three to nineteen seventy nine. So what's that? That's Long sixteen time. years. Sounds like you had some interesting moments. You mentioned something about a, a snake. Ah, oh, yeah, in Kenya. We had a house, normal three-bedroom house, except that our front and back doors were like the stable doors. You know, they hinge. Mm -hmm. You can pull the top open and leave the bottom closed. And we had your drain pipes and everything else. But about 20 feet away from our back door, there was this massive tree that 
had been eaten away and, you know, over the years since British colonialism had started, they hadn't cut the tree down. One night, I remember my father racing into the bathroom with a gun, the only thing he could pick up, and coming, you know, there being a blast in the bathroom and coming out with this black mamba dangling in his hand straight into the, you know, the bin outside, into the bin. I don't know what happened because, you know, being his kid, we were kept away because obviously of the danger. But I do remember that probably the next day after that, he started hunting around the house for the nest because the mamba is one of those rare creatures that they mate for life. You know, they find a mate and that's it. So he knew that there had to be either the male or the female around. He, you know, did careful search of the house then he went to check into this tree and here the nest of them were they're deadly right the black mamba is possibly the most deadliest snake in the face of the earth the green mamba is actually even deadlier because he will hunt you down the green mamba and my father i guess was you know we haven't talked about this but i guess that he was scared that this partner of the mamba would hunt us down when we were out in the garden. Because we as kids would play in the garden. I mean, it was a huge front yard, you know. There was about an acre of mown lawn at the front yard that we kids would play in. And um, he was scared because there was all bush bushland around us. I mean, this is real Africa we're talking about. But yeah, anyway, he found the, um, found the nest of mamba and threw in a Molotov cocktail, burned the tree down and the snakes and called the fire brigade, and the fire brigade arrived three hours later and said, why did you do this? My father had to do a lot of explaining. I'm sure they understood. Oh, they did. So now you moved to Australia. Why did you move there? Uh, We came to Australia because my father and mother divorced, and then my mother died. Um, She died of an alcoholic drug drug overdose binge. She OD'd on um, Valium. And he married uh, an Australian woman in 1978. And her father died in late 1978. And we migrated here to Australia to be with her mother. That's a lot of cultural changes going from England to Africa to Australia. Uh, Which is your favorite place? In all honesty, it has to be Africa because I grew up there. Yeah, I've got a, you know, aside from my mother and father arguing all the time and a hellish upbringing, there was a lot of beauty that I saw in Africa that, you know, it'll always be there. It's pretty interesting. Anything interesting happened to you in Australia? Other than be getting married and marrying the wrong woman, no. Well, you're, there's a long list of that. <laughs> it's a, a long a list lot of that. Of people, yeah, but a lot of people have that problem. Despite the fact that we were living in apartheid, in South Africa, you know, and going through a horrendous political turmoil there. We slept with our doors unlocked and our windows open, all right? It was just, you know, we had bars in the windows, but at least the windows were open. We came to Australia, like I said, in 1979, and every single solitary person had their doors locked and their windows closed every night. I just found that amusing, you know, because this is... Well, they reckon that Australia is the safest country in the world to live in and really? the luckiest country, that? and yet they locked up. Why is that? I couldn't make sense of it, and I still don't to this day. You um, know, it's funny. One of the things I like about the Internet and the people I meet is uh, when you can talk to somebody from different countries like we're doing right now. I'm in the U.S., you're in Australia. And I remember years ago I was a member of a chess club on the Internet. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was playing chess with this guy. I had no idea where he was from. And he says, um, hang on, I'll be right back. This stupid giraffe is sticking his head in the window. <laughs> oh, yeah. I do remember things like that. Yeah. Um, and I, he, he was gone when he came back. And I says, what did you say? <laughs> he, goes, he says, I looked up and the giraffe had stuck his head in my window. <laughs> and I started laughing. I yep. said, where are you? He goes, Africa. I can relate to things like that, you know, sort of like seeing gazelle in the backyard of um, the house we had in Kenya, you know, going for a half an hour drive down the road and seeing a rhinoceros or, you know. That's wild. Yeah, it's See, I, really I, wild. I grew up in New York City. Our idea of wild animals was a cow. 
<laughs> when we when I was a little kid, I'll never forget it as long as I live. I was a little kid, and uh, we went upstate New York for a picnic. And I was about, I guess, maybe five, six. My father stopped, and there was a field of cows. And it was the first time in my life I had seen anything that wasn't a dog, a rat, or a pigeon, or a cat. Mm-hmm. And I looked at this cow, and I thought, my God, they're huge. So we got up, and we walked uh, walked by the fence, and the cow... Uh, one of them started walking towards us. And I was thinking, uh-oh, is it going to charge us? <laughs> <laughs> I knew nothing about that stuff, you know. Uh, right. Now, I could tell you how to dodge a 63 Chevy, but <laughs> when it came to animals, I, mean, I thought this cow, you know, it might have been a rhinoceros for all I knew. Well, you're old enough to remember the film Born Free, aren't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, Elsa. Yeah. Uh, let, um, Elsa, the story Elsa. of Elsa. Yes. Joy Adamson. George and Joy Adamson were our neighbors. Really? And we knew um, Bill Travers and Virginia McKenna as well. They were, you know, they were sort of local, locals, but not quite locals in our area. So, yeah, you know, it's sort of, that's how wild we were. Wow. Did you actually see Elsa? No, Elsa died in 57, um, okay. a long yeah. time before we got there. But I've been to her, I've been to her rock. Um, you know, The Rock, they sh- I don't know if you'd remember the film, but The Rock no. at the very end where she disappears over the edge with the the male lion. Mm-hmm. That's called Elsa's Rock in the northwest frontier. Um, I've been there and seen her grave because she's buried there. But yeah, these are all little things that join to make you know, the whole picture of my life in Africa beautiful. Um, I have somebody in my life who has been a great godsend to me, and she has pulled me out of my reserved, you know, quietness a great deal. You know who I'm talking about. Yes. Um, I'm sure you can say her name. Nobody would know who it is. For those of you out there who are listening right now, and um, obviously I can't have Chris on camera with me because he is in Australia and I am in West Virginia, But Chris and I met in a chat room, and I visit chat rooms all over the Internet, all kinds of chat rooms. And um, not only is it a great way to meet friends and things, it's also great research for people and a great resource. But Chris and uh, his lady friend in the chat room uh, are very, very special people. And we got to chatting, and we talked about him coming on to talk about his time in Africa and things, and I appreciate Chris coming on. So I, I hope everybody's enjoying the show. And uh, Chris, you wanted to say something about your lady friend? Yeah, she's adorable. That's the only way I can put it. Um, I was shattered from my divorce, as a lot of men are, and I slipped into this um, netherworld of, you know, minding my own business and everything else and slowly and surely you know every time i'd log on to the chat room she'd say hi to me and you know we'd laugh and we'd carry on and everything else but then slowly and surely she pulled me out i don't think she even realized she was doing this she pulled me out and she'd make me smile with a little comment she'd made and then she'd make me laugh and then you know before you knew it we were talking to each other all the time and became very 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 close um well, I'm going to say right now that um, I know his lady friend online, and I think she's one of the finest ladies I've ever met. She is obviously intelligent. She's incredibly sweet and friendly. She's nice to everybody. And um, she has a way about her that even in a chat room, you can tell she's a quality lady. Oh, yeah. Definitely quality. A1 quality. And I love her very much. You know, I know that I'm 11,000 miles away from her, but it's still, you know, what I feel for her is real. As real as, you know, she'd be standing beside me right now sort of thing. Well, people Um, don't think about it the way it was like 10, 15 years ago when people first started meeting online and dating and then they'd meet in real life. And, you know, it was almost like a joke back then. But today, one in five relationships begin online. So it, it's more common now, and people have learned to accept it more often. I like people, and the uniqueness of them always attracts me, and that's why I do segments about people on my show, because for me, it's all about the people. Everything I do yes. is about the people, you know? The people in the show, the people that are, are watching my, my uh, shows or listening to them or watching my movies, everything I do, all of my films and things... Um, 
are based not on uh, like a mechanical idea. It's based on the people. Mm -hmm. I've been working on a movie for years, and I've done some uh, shooting for it about my life in a 3D virtual world as an events director. And it's all true stories. And the thing that always amazes me, and, and the Internet is a wealth of this, you can't invent anything that comes up close to what people have really said and done. You know, yeah. you, can't, you can't make it up compared exactly. to reality. Well, Chris, I appreciate you coming on the show. My pleasure. Always a pleasure. <laughs> and we'll get together for some coffee again pretty soon. All right, everybody, thanks for listening. We appreciate you tuning in. This is Dan again. We're going to keep on going with this series and look around for some more interesting folks to interview. We have in the past, of course, had interviews with a witch, a lady into steampunk, and quite a few others. People really are the most fascinating things on the universe. So check back. We're going to have some more people to talk to soon. This show is brought to you by... 